Not sure who the Macedonians are, what they have to do with Jewish history, or why their name sounds like a tree nut? Don't fret, because I'm here to fill you in on everything. Between the reign of Alexander the Great and the establishment of the Hasmonean dynasty, Jewish leaders are forced to make historic sacrifices for their religious freedom and authority. Under Greek influence and oppression, these heroes stand up for their Jewish values to the point of death, and people like Mattathias and Judah Maccabee, and Hannah and her seven sons are memorialized for centuries afterwards. Many wars are fought, and conflicts abound, even within the community. But the Jewish people persevere, fighting for their religious and political freedom. If you're like me, you might avoid someone who ends their name with the title, The Great. But ego trip aside, Alexander is actually pretty good to the Jewish people. When he conquers Jerusalem in 332 BCE, he becomes the only conqueror in a thousand years who does not order the city to be destroyed. Much of the Jewish community loves him for it, and suddenly there are a bunch of Jewish federation buildings named in his honor. But upon his death 11 years later, a fight breaks out between Alexander's generals over his succession. On the right side of the ring is Seleucus, who establishes a dynasty in the area now known as Syria. On the left side of the ring is Ptolemy, who establishes rule in Egypt. They battle for control over the Jewish state of Judea, changing leadership at least five times over the next 30 years. Eventually, Egypt wins rulership and holds the title for the next 100 years until 198 BCE, when Antiochus III reconquers Judea for the Seleucids. During the reign of Antiochus III, Judea is still under its own autonomous province under Jewish rule. It's under watch, but in control, like a teenager with a new driver's license. At the center of this province is Jerusalem, where the high priest of the temple acts as both religious and political leader, along with the Council of Elders, or Gerousia, who hold authority on certain matters. But similar to the areas of Egypt and Syria under the Macedonian Empire, Greek Hellenist culture becomes a prominent part of the conquered people of Judea. Many Hellenist Jews start taking Greek names, wearing Greek clothing, and joining the A.E. Pi frat. Greek becomes the language of administration and literature. Many Jewish people even begin to study the Bible in Greek, the ultimate sign of integration into Greek culture. However, not all Jews are aboard the Musaka and Lamb train. Even though the temple in Jerusalem still acts as the religious, political, and social focal point of the province, many feel that the religious capital has lost its holiness to paganism and idolatry. Non-Jewish settlers have brought their idols, and the Hellenist Jews do nothing to stop them. A gymnasium is established in Jerusalem, a hallmark of Greek metropolis and social life, and begins to replace the temple as the Mecca of the province. Many Jews are offended by the desecration of their holy sites and by the Hellenistic emphasis on the physical, which clashes with their religious emphasis on the spiritual. Other Jews, like me, just don't like the pressure of going to the gym. Deepening this gap with Greek culture is the succession of power from Antiochus III to his son Antiochus IV. Number four is not as tolerant to the Jews as his father was. He forces the people to assimilate and punishes death upon those who refuse. In time, even the temple begins to succumb to Greek influence. The high priesthood, normally passed down through Aaron's family lineage, is taken over by a Hellenist named Menelaus, who murders the previous high priest and steals money and treasures from the temple to appease the king. Many of the Hellenist Jews support these maneuvers and may have even suggested them to Antiochus IV. Many observant Jews, however, feel that the foundation of their religion is threatened. Among the latter group are Mattathias and his family, the Hasmoneans, who leave Jerusalem for the safety of the surrounding towns and hills to gather the seeds for Jewish resistance. Antiochus IV begins to up the ante on Jewish oppression. He orders Jews to make sacrifices to Greek gods and desecrate the Sabbath. He forbids circumcision of newborn sons, study of the Bible, and any observance of the Torah, making these Jewish actions punishable by death. By outlawing these distinct pillars of Jewish life, Antiochus introduces a new type of danger to the Jewish people. Not the physical, genocidal anti-Semitism seen before, but rather a cultural anti-Semitism that threatens to destroy the Jewish religion. The biggest of these cultural threats to the Jewish people? Bacon. One man named Eliezer understands the greater danger posed by these decrees and sets an example of defiance. Antiochus himself orders Eliezer to eat a pig, a major transgression in the Bible. But Eliezer knows that any offense is a threat to his community, and even something as small as an egg McMuffin is a symbol of humiliation that a Jew has abandoned their beliefs. So Eliezer bravely chooses to defy Antiochus and defends his religion. He refuses to eat the pig. 
As punishment, Eliezer is tortured to death. Witnessing this act of defiance, another family of martyrs stands up against the king. A woman named Hannah and her seven sons are also ordered to eat pig, but they too choose death. One by one, each of the sons is tortured and killed until Hannah herself submits to the same fate. This story of defiance is so powerful that later, even Christian Europe begins to celebrate these seven martyrs, making them the symbol of heroism, and Antiochus, the symbol of the Antichrist. But back in Judea, Antiochus can't stop and won't stop. His efforts toward Jewish oppression continue throughout the country, and the same decree makes its way to Mattathias and his five sons in the city of Modin. A group of soldiers stand before the town and order every Jew to sacrifice a pig to Zeus and then eat its flesh. As the villagers listen in horror, Mattathias and his sons stand before them and refuse to submit. They cry out that they will not turn aside from religion. Only this time, instead of accepting death, Mattathias and his sons seize the soldiers and kick the altar to the ground. They stab and kill the soldiers. The Maccabees have started a revolt. That's right, it's time to throw your latkes in the air singing Ayo, because we're talking about the story of Hanukkah. The Hasmonean family is known today as the Maccabees because of Mattathias' son Judah, who was nicknamed the Maccabee, or the Hammer. Their story is recorded in the book of Maccabees 1 and 2, which are not included in the canonical Bible text, but are the crucial sources of this turning point in Jewish history. The story of a group of untrained Jewish warriors who fight a war of beliefs and values against the world's greatest army and empire. The reality of the situation is mind-blowing. The Hasmoneans know there are almost no odds in their favor, but they also know they have no choice. This is their mission, and it is up to God to decide whether they win. After their act of defiance, the Maccabees take up arms against Antiochus and his army and flee to the hills with farmers and peasantry, all committed to defending their religion. They wage a war against their rulers, and a year later, Mattathias is killed in battle. His son Judah takes over to lead the revolt, and it's he who captured Jerusalem and restores the temple in 164 BCE. Judah makes a bold move and forms an alliance with Rome, at the time a growing power and enemy of the Seleucids. After five years of continued expansion and conquest, Judah is also killed in battle. When you hear about the holiday of Hanukkah, you probably think of the menorah and eight crazy nights. As the Talmud recounts, the Jewish people reclaim the temple from the Greeks and finally restore it to its glory after years of vandalism and idolatry. When they light the menorah once again, they can only find enough oil for one day. But a great miracle happens. The oil lasts for way longer. Six days. Just kidding, eight days, obviously. The story of Hanukkah is arguably the most famous Jewish holiday, but there's so much more to it than most people know. We may eat latkes, jelly donuts, and other oily foods that celebrate the menorah and destroy our facial pores, but we also celebrate the miracle of a small Jewish army defeating the world's greatest global power of the time. We celebrate the establishment of a prosperous, self-ruling dynasty and a successful fight for Jewish autonomy and self-determination. We celebrate the religious right for Jews to exist as Jews. The Hasmoneans lead Judea to victory, and the boys are finally back in town. Judah's two brothers, Jonathan and Simeon, take leadership and begin a 129-year-long reign of Jewish independence and sovereignty in the land of Israel. They continue to expand the country borders and reinstate the position and authority of the high priest. Seven years into their Jewish sovereignty, John Hyrcanus I begins to mint coins of his own, a major mark of independence in the ancient world. His son, Aristobulus, who ruled for just one year, bestows upon himself the title of king. And 26 years after the establishment of the Jewish dynasty, the Roman Senate officially recognizes Jewish independence. The Jewish kingdom is surviving and thriving with military prowess and economic prosperity. But don't get too comfy, because it isn't long before the peace of Jewish sovereignty is disrupted. Under John Hyrcanus, a rift develops between the Hasmoneans and another group of Jews. The second group, known as the Pharisees, anchors their beliefs in the idea that the Bible has always had both written and oral law, to which Moses and his people adhered for centuries. Based on religious grounds, they oppose the combined position of the high priest and the monarchy, and reject the change in Hasmonean policy of military expansion. Of the more controversial actions instituted by the later generations of Hasmoneans is the practice of forced conversion. John Hyrcanus sets the stage when he conquers the Edomians and becomes the first Jewish leader to convert a full race of people to Judaism, which is in direct opposition to Jewish law. Later, Hasmoneans follow suit with the conquest of the Eturians, setting a dangerous precedent for future practices. 
Tensions between the Pharisees and the Hasmoneans grows under the rule of John Hyrcanus's two sons, Aristobulus and Alexander Yanai, when the two Hasmonean leaders begin to adopt the practices of the Sadducees. The Sadducees are another Jewish sect in direct conflict with the Pharisees, believing that only the written Bible is holy. They take issue with the liberal interpretations of the Pharisees' traditional Judaism that occasionally contradict their observance of the written text, and violence soon erupts among the Jewish nation. In time, a civil war breaks out. It takes a queen to end the violence, which Salome Alexandra does after succeeding her husband Alexander Yanai. She's Pharisaic, unlike her husband, and creates compromise by reinstating the Pharisaic laws that had previously been in effect. But when her reign ends, another civil war erupts between her two sons. The war escalates between the brothers, while at the same time, the Roman Empire moves into the region. The internal conflict between the Hasmoneans only worsens the Jewish cause, and Rome ultimately succeeds in conquering the Jewish kingdom and establishing a Roman state. As the famous Jewish historian Josephus writes, because two brothers could not get along, we lost our freedom and our liberty to Rome. Twenty years later, a rift in the Roman Empire allows the next Hasmonean leader to take the throne in Judea. Mattathias Antigonus takes advantage of the shaky political situation resulting from the deaths of Pompey and Julius Caesar to gain the support of the Parthians and restore the Hasmonean kingdom 23 years after being abolished. The Jews in the area rush to his side in a display of national support for the Hasmoneans. But all good things must come to an end, and Mattathias Antigonus cannot hold his position for long against the larger Roman forces. Three years after his appointment, Mattathias Antigonus is defeated. After withstanding a five-month siege, Jerusalem falls to the Roman Empire. Though the temple stands and the Jewish people remain in Jerusalem, the Romans give over full control of Judea to Herod to rule under the Roman Empire. The Hasmonean dynasty is no more. The success of the Maccabees has never stopped inspiring Jewish pride and victory. Decades later, in the first and second centuries, Jews tried to mimic the success of the Hasmoneans by revolting against the Romans. And over 2,000 years later, the Hasmonean story is still officially celebrated every year on Hanukkah. The story is one of Jewish freedom and religious independence, of martyrs and heroes sacrificing their lives to save Jewish practice and culture. Names like Eleazar, Mattathias, and Hannah represent the courage of Jews to defy orders and fight for their religion. Though the Hasmonean dynasty was ultimately defeated, these heroes imbued confidence among the Jewish people throughout history and until today. Even now, the Jewish people fight to keep our religion and culture alive against assimilation and anti-Semitism. Yet despite our struggles, despite even our own differences in religious belief and observance, the Jewish people continue to survive and leave a legacy of strength, community, and nationality. Hey guys, thanks for watching this video. If you like what you see here and you want to see more, make sure to check out our other videos. In addition, make sure to subscribe and hit that notification bell so you'll know first when we release new videos.